It's going. You are listening to the worst marathon ever. Yay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the third worst. Wait, third worst? How did that happen? The second worst marathon ever. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. And if for, for a second there, was it the third worst? Had we been eclipsed by another marathon? That we... Yeah, there was this marathon that happened in London. But once we started talking, we slipped right back uh, underneath it again. We had a second. But, oh well. <laughs> so we're, we're doing the Pixar rules here. We're in the home stretch. And I keep farting. <laughs> Oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. You I'm, will be. I'm afraid at the end of the last episode, the, all the windows had fogged up in the car. And they're going to fog up doubly quick now, I suppose. It's going to be a brown haze on all uh, the So today and tomorrow will be our final episodes. Oh, thank goodness. Today we are on rule number 21. Rule number 21, you gotta identify with your situation slash characters. You can't just write cool. What would make you act that way? Hmm. That's interesting. There are movies where they tried to write cool. And yeah, they... Will Smith is in all of them. <laughs> and, well, I was gonna say they didn't work. But Will Smith's movies made a damn lot of money in the box office so people thought it was cool at least okay well give me an example then of a movie where oh. they wrote cool i'm trying to think of uh, the one that came to mind is the lost boys people love that i mean i'm not one of them yeah but people I'm, love that i watched that and it was supposed to be all cool and it was like they played the doors when you're a stranger faces look good which should be cool but Except for it didn't... was the psychedelic furs, right? Oh, was it really? Wait, it wasn't who, the doors. Who was it that covered that? I don't know. That makes me like the movie less now. Yeah, it wasn't the doors version. It was oh, the superior man. 1987 version by one of your bands. <laughs> when you're strange, yeah, I, I don't remember who it was. The psychedelic furs. It wasn't the psychedelic furs. Canadian first. band. Stop that. Come on. I want to like you. My wife has that one of their albums. They must have been Canadian. You're wrong. <laughs> but something like that. Oh, for, The Craft. Okay. The Craft is one of those movies where it was just supposed to be cool. And it didn't connect with people. At least not very much. I mean, maybe there's people out there like, oh, my gosh. Big Anklevich said The Craft wasn't the greatest movie ever. He's so wrong. Well, there were definitely people that said that about Lost Boys. You know who directed Lost Boys? The person who was just talking in falsetto about him being wrong? Your mom? Joel Schumacher directed that. Oh. So go... Did you say my mom? <laughs> hey. Sorry, that phrase is no longer cool. What people say now is, your face. Do they really? Yeah. Okay, I will make a note of that. I'm one of those middle-aged guys now that's writing teenager dialogue. But the way that actual teenagers talk would be so stupid to my ears that I'd be like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to write like that. <laughs> no. But the way that I write a teenager, it would probably sound phony to the ears of a, a real teenager unless I do it right. Wasn't there somebody that said that I didn't write teenage dialogue well in the many, many, many complaints about that story? <laughs> there may have been. I don't know. I mean, as long as you're not saying obviously out-of-date stuff like golly like hella uh, you could say hella nobody says hella anymore come on i saw a thing they put out a thing on facebook well they didn't put it out on facebook they probably put it on some actual site and then somebody linked to it on facebook but they had gone through and found the specific word or phrase of slang and they had one for every state in the union Really? And hella was the phrase for California. And? And what? Well, you're from California. How does that make oh. you feel? Hella is it... the third stupidest word okay, ever. Okay, let me take it back. I mean, let me... Let me let me take you back to let when me I lived in California. Go further into the identification. In the paragraph where they talked about it, they said it was a big thing in Southern California. 
Southern California and Northern California are like New York and Boston. They don't agree with things like that. People didn't say hello where I was from. Of course, it probably hadn't been invented yet because that was a long time ago when I was a young man. They probably all say hello now. I don't know. But yeah, people in Southern California assume that everyone in Northern California follows their lead. They and people correctly. in Northern California just flip them the bird every time they see them. So that's just kind of the way that the thing goes. But uh, anyways, that was just to say, somebody must say hella if it's the official word. <laughs> it's the official word? <laughs> According Come to on. this magazine, it was. Okay, well, I would <laughs> like you to post a link to that. Well, you can't. I, well, we'll try. But Let's I, see if I can find it. Boy, by the way. Talk about white people problems. Trying to find an old Facebook post that somebody put in there and you can't oh. quite remember who did it. It's yeah. the hugest time black hole <laughs> imaginable because you can't ever find it. You can't just do a search like you normally would because Facebook doesn't load everything. Yeah. It makes you go all the way to the bottom and then it loads five more posts and that makes yeah. you go to the bottom and loads five more posts and it loads oh. it differently every time you go back and yeah there are sometimes that you you'll never find it again yeah like it, okay I, I know the girl that posted it so i'm just gonna do a search for her and it was like six days ago but i read it yesterday what <laughs> that doesn't make any sense guys <laughs> the thing that drives me crazy and i don't know if you've had this happen to you yet but you're looking up facebook on your phone right okay that's not happened to me yet. okay so it hasn't happened to you yet but this happens to me all the time i'm looking at facebook on my phone and i'm reading an article that's interesting uh oh i know where this but is but then i'm like oh i gotta take a dump or something so i stop <laughs> well i guess i wouldn't stop to take it because i could sit there and still read it we'll say i just had to take a whiz <laughs> okay like like an so i needed man. my hands free so that I could actually point it in the right direction. So I close it. And then when I'm done, I come back, I open up Facebook. And as I go to finish reading, it refreshes. Automatically. Automatic. I can't stop. I didn't tell it to. It just refreshes. The article goes away. And my pro, whatever it's called, your news feed or whatever, all those stories have changed too. Every post is different. I don't know who posted the link to begin with. I didn't look to see. And it's gone. It's just totally gone. And I was only halfway through the article. I'm just like, who did it, Scooby? I'm never going to know. Those meddling kids are never going to solve the mystery. <laughs> it's, I hate that. I wish I could figure out how to make Facebook not refresh like that for me. It's to the point where I've tried to come up with, like, I, I've thought several times, like, you know what? Because they have a thing where you can save a link. And I've started to think maybe any time I'm going to click on a link, I just need to save the link so that this stops happening to me because it's driving me crazy. It's really getting frustrating um, well, in my first world. <laughs> in your first world problems. I don't do the phone Facebook thing because I have to pay for every minute of Internet I use. But the fact that if I looked something up on Facebook on my phone, it's a different Facebook than I would look up at home. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whereas the, the, it's all in a different order. And what happened to the thing on the side that used to, oh, and it's not there. And well, how do I do? I was chatting with somebody, but it's not on there anymore. That kind of thing. Oh, it just sucks. Cause you know, sometimes I'll do a search and it'll be like M dot target dot com. And I was like, what M it's cause it's mobile. It's the mm -hmm. mobile version. I said, I don't want the that I, down version. I had this at home and I just wanted to call up the same article. I, uh, Okay, um... Was there a Pixar? We were, we were talking about... I had to pull out my phone again. Oh, it was something so about cool. So that I cool. could reread the rule so I could remember what the hell we were talking okay, about. Okay, let's see if I can remember. It's, you need to be able to relate to your protagonist, not just write what you think is cool. Does that sound right? Yeah, you're close. You've got to identify with your situation slash characters. Can't just write cool. What would make you act that way okay i don't get it and then these never have anything more right no yeah the articles don't say for example when um, we were writing frozone's wife it's just a list all i can assume is that yeah they that you can't i mean what's going to make you do the thing that you do you can't just do it just because it's cool you know like we we're giving examples of movies where they were just writing cool 
and they didn't really have depth to them to make you uh, give a crap later. I don't know, the thing that <laughs> comes to mind, and this doesn't necessarily make sense, is the part, I mean, I guess all of the Matrix, 75% of it is just trying to be cool. They've got these guys all in black, with their trench coats, and their glasses, their sunglasses on all the time, even though it's dark. They go in to rescue Morpheus from that building, and they come in the front door where the security guards are, and there's you know, know, dozens of security guards with automatic weapons, and they just come in, and it's all like this choreographed coolness. And the cool music even comes on, you know, that heavy bass stuff that you would get in the 90s with movies like Face Off. All the, all the John Woo inspired movies. Yeah, it made me laugh the last time I watched Matrix with my kids just a couple months ago. And when that scene came on, I was like, oh my gosh. Up until now, I couldn't have just said, oh yes, this movie is from this time period. But as soon as I saw that scene, I was like, this is so 90s. Mm. This is bit where, like, they're, they're, like, all choreographed and they, like, throw their bag full of guns down and slide her over. And then they, like, pull the two guns out at once and they're shooting with both hands. And they're doing flips in their cool all-black leather outfits. And I was just like, oh, man. <laughs> that cements it right into that time period for you. The rest of it, I mean, everything, you didn't look at the CG graphics in there and go, oh, that's some pretty early CG. Woo. <laughs> you never felt that way with that movie at all. But the style is what totally goes 90s to you. But yeah, why would they be doing all this stuff? Why would they just walk in and like, I'm so cool and I'm just going to shoot people coolly. Pew, pew, pew. I'm cool. Well, see, I, I don't really remember The Matrix because I wasn't one of those. But isn't it all a dream? And you can just reshape who you are in your dream and make well, yourself cool? If, if and, It's you know. basically that, yeah. I mean, it's all a computer simulation, but only the one can do that because he can see through The Matrix and make it do what he wants. So you can't just shape your dream... You're supposed to be confused, so it's such a convincing thing that you think it's real life. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I guess in the back of my mind, I'm confusing it with the third Nightmare on Elm Street movie, where it's just like, it's just a dream. So if I want to be cool in my dream, I'm cool! And all that. You know, I was thinking of In Armageddon, which was a huge hit movie and just terrible on almost every single front. All the, the wisecracks at the end of the movie... And it just came fast and furious. And I was just like, you guys, the whole, the fate of the world is at stake. And they're just joking and joking and joking. And I lost all suspension of disbelief because I was just like, you know, six billion lives are hanging in the balance and you're still cracking wise. I was like, wow, the, 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 apparently there are no stakes. You just guys <laughs> wanted it to be funny. Or... It's gallows humor. Come on, man. Well, if it had been done well, like in our last episode, right. yes, the gallows humor might have worked. But I just, uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm the one person in that theater that night that hated Armageddon. I um, never saw Armageddon. I did see Deep Impact, though. Deep Impact was a good movie. That's what I heard. And by I heard, I mean it was the good of those two. Did you not like Deep Impact? I liked it. No, I'm just saying it was the good of the Two asteroid movies is what I'd heard. That's what I meant when I said that's what I heard. Okay. <laughs> well, see, yeah, this one is hard to talk about because I think I'm not quite covering the the gist of it. I mean, all I'm focusing on is the cool part of that rule, but the important part is the what is it that you have to identify? Yeah, with you have to the identify situation. with the characters of the situation and figure out what it is that would make you do that so that. It seems believable, I guess. Okay, so so you want the character to say these funny lines, but you have to figure out a, a scenario in which you would say them. So it's not just because a cool guy would, right? Is am I getting? I think so. Yeah. See, I'm I'm tripping up on the word cool. Is cool bad? 
far as this rule goes, is cool a bad thing? I don't think cool is a bad thing if you can figure out why someone would do it. See, you can't I, just make it cool, but if you make cool make sense. You once said years ago that you knew it was a story written by Rish Outfield if the main character was a loser. That stuck with me all these years. I'm like, oh my gosh, all my characters do do this. But I will often have like his friend be cool or somebody that he hangs around with be cool so that there's like an obvious difference between me, the character that's based on me and the character that's based on you. But cool is not necessarily bad. It's they're using the word cool as a euphemism for unnatural, for artificial. Probably. For a cliched or a, something that's not earned, that's not a true emotional response. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. It, help me out. Help me understand what this Pixar rule is. Uh, how, how do I apply it to what I write? I think you just got to make your characters as real as possible. Make their reactions genuine. You can't have them do something just because the plot needs them to do it. You have to make it be, you know, the, the thing that they would do to make it seem realistic. Make it seem believable by uh, making your character identifiable. I don't know if that's <laughs> the right word for it, but if, to identify with that character. So all the way through the story, as you're doing it, you have to make this character somebody that we understand, that we know and we love, and we can see why they would act the way they would. So that when it comes time for them to do whatever it is that they're going to do, be it sacrifice themselves or turn their back and walk away, that it makes sense and that it's believable and people don't go, oh, come on. They're really just going to be cracking jokes the whole time while the world's about to end? But we've all felt that for one thing or another. When, when something is not earned, when a character... I, we talk about the show Flash sometimes. I know you get frustrated where you're like, why would somebody react that way? That is so out of character. You know what I'm saying? I think you were telling me about that they'd said a, a certain character always responds a certain way. And it's awful. And then this huge thing was placed in front of them and she responded in a totally level-headed, thoughtful, measured, Understanding logical way. way. And you're like, whoa, how, what, wh who is this? Yeah. And it's not the character we know and hate. I mean, love. <laughs> and I don't know that that's necessarily what the Pixar rule is, except for you've got to lay the emotional groundwork or truth there so that when she responds in this way that the plot says she has to. It doesn't come out of left field. It's It feels like her natural reaction. Is, am I getting it right? Yeah, and I think, you know, they could have made this work if she had grown from one time to the next time. You know what I mean? If they'd done things where you're like, oh, yeah, she's not the same character that she was before. It's like Han Solo at the start of Star Wars versus Han Solo at the end. You know, he's changed. He's not the guy that's just going to be like, he's just going to turn his back and walk away. He's he's feels something now. And so instead he comes in and rescues Luke and says, okay, let's blow this thing and get out of here. Yeehaw. You got to build something like that in there. You can't just have them react one way to an, a, a, basically the exact same situation in one episode and a completely different way in the next episode. It just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work. And I don't know why they did it. I mean, it, it, it's not one episode to the next episode. I mean, obviously, it's, it was season one where she was having hissy fits every time. And season two when she suddenly is level-headed. But they didn't give us anything to show that she had progressed in some way. And now she's not going to throw a tantrum and get all upset every time somebody tries to be nice to her. Well, or, okay, using Han Solo as an example, the second movie begins, and he's like, look, I, I got to get out of here. I got this price on my head. I got, I, it's not that I don't care about your rebellion. I just, I, Luke's in trouble. 
I'll be right back. He's the same developed character he was at the end of Star Wars. He didn't revert to, you know, I mean, he somebody right. didn't hit the reset button and he becomes this jaded a-hole again. Right. He drops everything and risks his own life. He's told that you'll your Tauntaun will freeze. Before you reach the first marker. And he doesn't care. It's like his friend's out in it. That is kind of remarkable. You know what I mean? Yeah. That that they that they allowed this character. I mean, Han Solo is an interesting character, and he's a beloved character because of who plays him and and all that stuff. But there is that that aspect of he's willing to just die, basically, trying to save his friend when the movie begins. And uh, I, I I think that's kind of cool that you can see that kind of growth. I mean, we see that kind of growth with Luke through that trilogy as well. There never comes a point where he becomes the whining Tatooine boy again once he's progressed beyond that. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And, 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 and so I, I feel like the things that Luke does, okay, at the end of Empire Strikes Back, Luke chooses to die rather than join Vader. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I can't go back to when I was a little boy and saw it for the very first time and say, you know, I... I didn't buy that or anything like that, but it just, we had seen these steps, these scenes that are building toward that. That's the crux of that movie is Vader is going to put out his hand and Luke is either going to join him or not. And he chooses to die rather. You know what I mean? He doesn't try to make his escape or any of that stuff, you know? And maybe that's my interpretation. There might be other people out there that say, no, he doesn't choose to die. But I think he does because he's learned, you know, Yoda has taught him this stuff. Ben has taught him this stuff. His experience in the cave that he can become what he most despises and most fears has brought him to this point where naturally he's like, no, you know, I, I'll, I will choose the I'll never the join pit. you. And uh, I think that that's kind of amazing. And I, it's just because it's also a, a really bold thing for your hero to do you know in in jedi when luke actually snaps and he's just going to kick the crap out of vader that's the wrong thing that's that's what the emperor wants but they've built they've set up these dominoes to where you're like no i can see him going that way yeah vader is pushing the buttons the emperor is telling him lash out with your hatred and all this stuff until finally he can't take anymore and he does it and then he pulls himself back right from the edge, right when it's, you know, the point of no return. And again, doesn't he choose to die rather than give in to the dark side? I mean, I, I we know that the Emperor is going to kill him. But, you know what I mean? When he throws away that lightsaber and says, you know, you failed your highness. I'm a Jedi like my father before me. That's the crux of that movie. That's the pinnacle of that movie. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. The emotional, whatever you call it, Mid pendulum. Year. What? What's? What's the the <laughs> the joint that <laughs> everything hinges upon? Anyhow, I I don't know why. I, I guess I always go back to Star Wars because that's my modern mythology. My you know. Yeah, it's the thing you know better than anything else, probably. Yeah. So you can point out. Every last little story point and stuff. But, uh, okay, uh, and and here I have to bring up the negative aspect. But Anakin Skywalker's turn to the dark side feels so much less natural and less earned or less... What's the word? Uh, is it believable that I want? I it just The dominoes don't fall right for Anakin's turn. Because basically he wants to save Padme. He's had these premonitions that she's going to die... And Mace Windu is standing in his way of that, I, I guess. So he cuts off Mace Windu's arm but because the Emperor has dangled this possibility that you can save Padme. And so he, he hurts Mace Windu. The Emperor kills Mace Windu. Luke falls to his knees and says, I'll do anything you want. And the Emperor says, go to the Jedi Temple, temple and kill everybody, right? And Luke, and Anakin does it. Have I been calling him Luke? I mean to say Anakin. You've been calling him Anakin mostly. <laughs> but that never felt right to me. It, it always felt like he'd been manipulated into getting to this point 
and he never really was in charge of his own destiny. He never really made a choice to yeah, to do to embrace the dark. You don't remember? It's in, not like he believes in it or anything. He's just doing it because he thinks. The emperor says, "Your hate has made you powerful," but I don't think there is a scene like that with Anakin. Where Anakin can feel like the rage or the dark side within him. And he's just like, oh, I can see now what I could become and all that. There needed to be something like that where he said, I'm choosing to embrace this destiny instead of the one that was placed before me. Instead of what Yoda said or Obi-Wan said or Qui-Gon said. Instead of what Plo Koon said. Hey, none of that. And so for me, that never felt earned. Anakin goes and he kills a bunch of children, but to what end? What does he accomplish by doing that? I, I don't remember the movie well enough, but my memory says nothing. It's not until the Emperor says, go to Mustafar and kill all the Separatist leaders or whatever, where Anakin's like, okay, yeah, that'll finish this whole Clone War thing that, you know, the I'll finish what Obi-Wan and I started by wiping out all these bastards. This one guy, Newt Gunray, wanted my wife's head on a plate for Bosk's sake. So I'll go wipe him out or whatever. That I can understand. For Boss Nass's sake. But there, yes, that's right. <laughs> you saw no tinkin use up better than George Lucas? I, I just, yeah, I never felt like A, B, and C came in the right order on that thing. And hopefully that's kind of what this Pixar rule is about, is, is it has to be earned. Yes, yes, we need to get to C or D, but you've got to have a logical build-up. Is it a logical, a true emotional build-up to it? I, yeah, a believable build-up. You believe- have to build the foundation before you can put on the steeple. So you can put on the very tippity-top. I don't know. Is there something else like a steeple that's at the tippity-top? A pinnacle? A spire? A, okay. A radio antenna. There you go. But the transition between... Anakin Skywalker, the Chosen One, and Anakin Skywalker, the Dark Lord, has to feel true to you, to what you would do, or at least believable in a, yeah, that I think if those were my options, that's what I would choose as well. And maybe maybe I'm totally wrong, and it's just my own personality is talking, but if I could understand why Anakin does what he does, I would like that movie more. Yeah, I think we talked about in the last one, the exercise where you have to take the building blocks of a film you didn't like and turn it into a film that you do like. What is what is it that's the difference? And with those prequels, I think you, you talked about Anakin Skywalker, the chosen one, turning to Anakin Skywalker, the Dark Lord. Anakin Skywalker shouldn't have been the chosen one to begin with. It shouldn't have been this immaculately conceived space Jesus that somehow becomes space Satan because it's it's too far to go, it seems to me. He should have started like Luke, who is just an everyday kid, someone you can relate with. Like this rule says, you know, you need to be able to relate with your characters so that you can understand why they would do it because you need to know why you would do it. And that, I think, might be mistake number one that they made. Why did they go there? Because I don't know who would have thought. Well, does that ever come up again? I don't think they mention the Chosen One thing in Episode 2 at all. And the only time it's mentioned in Episode 3 is when Obi-Wan says, You are supposed to be the Chosen One! Finish the sentence. You were supposed to bring balance to the Force, not plunge it into darkness. Wow, that's awful. That's not really the line, is it? Yes, it is. At least I think it is. I don't know. I haven't watched that movie in a long time. You were the chosen one. It was said that you would destroy this and not join them. Bring balance to the Force, not leave it in darkness. Okay, Why, what does him being the chosen one bring to the table? Except for, is that a reason why Qui-Gon would take him and think that he could be trained by the Jedi Council or accepted by the Jedi Council? Is it... 
I don't think it brings it's it's uh, we've talked about this too in this marathon the crutch of the prophecy every movie had to have a prophecy of some sort neo was prophesied to be the one why there's a prophecy at all in some futuristic sci-fi computer movie i don't know it doesn't make any sense but it, it was like the thing that you had to have every movie uh harry potter was prophesied to be the one that stops the he who must not be named old david farland <laughs> <laughs> it just seems like that's basically all they did i mean and i wouldn't put it past george lucas because he seems to be creatively bankrupt really when it comes down to it like he just blew his whole load years ago and hasn't created anything new and worthwhile in forever and so now he's just like uh, let's see uh what really sells well these days uh young boy who was the chosen one yeah that's really really doing well these days it doesn't pay off there's no payoff to it there's no thing that he was gonna save the world it's just a vague weird prophecy you know what i'm saying he brings balance to the force what the hell does that even mean oh well, yeah what does it mean i mean we've for all these years since 1998 we've argued about how does the force need to come back into balance what does that mean I don't think that there is an answer. The only answer I have for it is he helped kill off all the Jedis so that there was the same amount of Jedis alive as there was Siths. Now it's in balance. There's two good guys, two bad guys. That's it. <laughs> yeah, but if that was part of that prophecy that Mace Windu knew about, then you sure don't want this kid anywhere near you. <laughs> like, You realize, of course, this kid's prophesied to kill a whole bunch of... well. He just cuts off my arm, but all the rest of you, he killed. I don't know. It just, that's, And yeah, they said, well, okay, he restores balance to the Force by killing the Emperor in Return of the Jedi. But what does balance mean? Now there's no more Dark Lords? Now there's no more practitioners of the dark side? How is that balance? I don't understand that. I guess balance is one of those words that white cisgendered people can't use. <laughs> Sorry, let me rephrase. Balance is a hard word. I don't know. Because balance sim seems to mean there's equalness on both sides. Right. So, Equality, is that the word? Yeah, so it does uh, does seem like him killing off all the Jedi means he fulfilled the prophecy. <laughs> but I, 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 see, I don't think it, it means anything. It was just some crap. So they're like, yeah, that sounds like a good prophecy. We don't mean to fulfill it ever. So who cares? We'll just make up something. But it's not like the Harry Potter prophecy where he's prophesied to, you know, to kill the Dark Lord or While whatever. both live, neither can survive or something like that, right? Something, yeah, it was something like that. I mean, that prophecy has an end to it. It can be fulfilled. This one is just a vague nothing. It's like what palm readers tell you. You know, when you go somewhere and they're like, ooh, um... Or like those people that tell you that they... they I, I feel a, a presence here. There's a, there's, a, there's a spirit in the room. It, it's someone beloved to you. And they wait until you go, oh, my mother? Yes, I think it's your mother. You know, it's one of those kind of things where they, it doesn't mean anything. They're just waiting for you to fill in the blanks. So it's a piece of crap, in other words, and, and it's a bad story crutch that I still hate, even though we just talked about this. I, it was weeks ago for us, but everybody <laughs> else only heard it a few, a few days ago, so we're retreading things. But um, Well, since the last time we did this dang thing, that last Star Wars trailer came out, and Han Solo becomes this Obi-Wan type character that says, the... Jedi, the dark side, it's all true. And it's hard to reconcile that Han Solo with the one from my childhood who was like, <laughs> you know, hokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. Hopefully in that movie it feels earned that he's grown to this point. You know what I mean? Because he ceases to be Han Solo if he becomes that character in in my mind and i 
I don't know. Maybe he's going to be that way from the very moment we meet him in episode 7. It has been dozens upon dozens of years since that happened. And he's lived his life with a couple of Jedi types since then. So I can see him eventually becoming a believer. And on top of that... I mean, not that I have any idea what this movie is really like, because it hasn't come out. It's still months away, but probably it came out yesterday for all you guys who are hearing these episodes now. But he's, like, older, and it's, it's, when I see it, it seems like he's, hey, yeah, you know, back in the good old days, this is what we did. You kids may not know about this, but, you know, it's like Chris Tucker... Wait, saying, what? hey, no, really, guys, I used to be a big star. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, but I, I, I made so much money in 1999 and 2000. Seriously, I've been living off that money ever since then. Can't you, would, you do it in a Chris Tucker voice? I can't. Can't you say, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? I made so much money. You would not believe it. It's true. I'm Michael Jackson. You're Tito. Yeah, I, I, that's a super dated reference. But if you're an old man like me, that was spot on, Chris Tucker. Okay. But yeah, I mean, it's it's it kind of seems like maybe that's his thing a little. I don't know. How I Han no Solo is like Chris Tucker by <laughs> B.D. Anklovich. It's just, uh, it's, I don't know. I mean, we'll see what is going on. It, that does seem like a funny bit of role reversal. But yeah, that's another thing. Oh, just when you say that, just that line, it it makes me think, oh man, did they blow with those stupid prequels. Ancient weapons? If a lightsaber is an ancient weapon, and this happened, what, 17 years ago? Seriously? Like, are we calling an F-16 an ancient weapon now because it came out? I mean, that's weirder. We're, we're calling a stealth bomber an ancient weapon. Yeah, seriously. That's basically what he's doing. Oh, gosh. There should, you know, the, the Republic should have collapsed 200 years before, and the Jedi have just been like the Sith, you know. There's only, like, two of them at a time still surviving in, in Dagobah somewhere by themselves. Well, it may be that that's what's happened in the 30 years since Return of the Jedi, um, I, it's just, it's so weird because the good guys won. The Jedi won, you know what I mean? Whereas in the prequels, the bad guys won. So you can understand maybe all talk of Jedi or all talk of, you know, the old Republic could have been squashed. Because, all right, let's say the Nazis, the Third Reich won. And by the 1950s, no young people remember what it was like before. Every part of the world is part of the third reich now no, and they control people, but 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 they control what people understand what people know what people what the history books slightly say slightly older people do know <laughs> okay yeah, maybe not an 18 year old doesn't know but a 30 year old knows i mean it's oh it's just a, it, it's silly no, no, you're you're right i i'm i i sounded like i was defending the prequels but i'm just <laughs> saying after 30 years, something has happened so that people don't believe that the Jedi ever existed and all that. And, and so I, I, I can't wait to find out what it is. I'm a little afraid because there's only one or two bad things that could happen for people not to believe in Jedi anymore after Return of the Jedi. <laughs> you know what I mean? Nothing good could have happened after Return of the Jedi for people to say, what? You know, I heard about those laser swords on a hollow once of my grandmother's. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Uh, the thing is, I think you're it, much more likely that we're completely misinterpreting it. And when we see the lines, it's not going to mean anything like what we thought. Okay. I mean, yeah, Ray may live on some backwoods planet. I and mean, that's what they still could... have the telegraph. That's what could have happened is, okay, we freed everyone from the Empire. What's going to happen when you free? Is the Empire just going to, tra you know, magically transition back into the Old Republic? Just as likely it could splinter into a million, I, I don't know how many 
systems there were, but a thousand separate independent systems that just live on their own and aren't governed by one huge overarching thing and uh, therefore they just do their I mean just the idea of an entire planet living under one government is a crazy sci-fi concept not if the Axis powers win World War II <laughs> it's still a crazy sci-fi concept because yeah the Axis powers okay yeah they control Europe, there's still so much of the world that didn't even smell the gunpowder in World War II, you know. But they were all backwoods countries. Yeah, but imagine how long it would take to march through all of them. It would take an entire lifetime and then some just to try and march through all of them and submit the rest of them to your rule. You may have owned the first world... Even just to conquer America by itself, just America would have probably taken way more than Axis powers who won World War II could have <laughs> mustered. By the end of the war, they were they were sending like pubescent boys out to fight. They okay, had nobody I... left. They killed everyone off. Yes, but all it takes is one technological breakthrough with splitting the atom... And Germany rules the entire planet through terror. Uh, and, and maybe I'm, I'm talking about stuff that I shouldn't be talking about. But it's just the, well, the, the, empire, the empire came empire. out without, with this Death Star. Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. Once news spreads of what happened to Alderaan, then suddenly... I mean, it's, it's weird because Alderaan is destroyed and instead of scattering the rebel alliance comes together and is like we're going to risk everything to take this thing out but it could so easily have gone the other way and it's just you know they all became cowards they all became self-interested they all have their own planets that they don't want to become asteroid fields out there in in space I don't know. I, I feel like I've, I'm talking about stuff that we that has nothing to do with Pixar rules. <laughs> oh, of course you are. We're long, far distant. I, I think we made our point about the rules, and now we're just talking. We're just quibbling over details that have nothing to do with it at this point. Okay. Well, I, hey, I apologize on that. Yes, when we see uh, episode seven, all of that stuff will make sense, unless it's a line like, "You speak of the prophecy of the." One to return balance to the force. You think it's this boy? And then it never makes sense. Or unless it's like that bit from the Men in Black trailer <laughs> where he has the, the gun or whatever. And then and then you watch the movie and it, it's not even in the movie. It was like something they cut out. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it was made just for the trailer. Yeah, maybe even made just... Yeah, it was... Just one of those things that doesn't even appear. It's it's complete gobbledygook. It's not even in the movie. Just something to get the fanboys a little stiffer. Oh, can you imagine <laughs> how evil J.J. Abrams would have to be to just, on the day, he has them do a bunch of different dialogue that's just for the trailer to mislead the fanboys that are going to pour over every single... I wouldn't put it past him. He's kind of like that. He's all about controlling that message that's going out. Ah, you who are listening to these episodes are, are laughing at how you guys were talking with anticipation about episode 7. Well, that happens. We've done that about many things. Go back through the archives, you'll see. Okay, we're going to call this quits. End the episode. And then we'll be back tomorrow with the final episode this of... The second worst marathon ever. Yeah, and if it's anything like today's episode, it will be the worst marathon ever. Yeah, we may supersede the worst marathon. We we did slip down the third worst marathon for all, all of like a minute. The thing was, I wasn't even paying attention. I don't know what we did to, you know. I think it was just because we hadn't started talking yet in, at oh. that point in that marathon. All right. See you next time, folks. Good night. That Gets My Goat is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. 
I'm one of those middle-aged guys now that's writing teenager dialogue, which I'm sure is laughable to real teenagers. But <laughs> I am, I in my mind, I'm still young. And so I think, but see, like, I would never use the word sick in place of cool because that, even though people have been doing that for 20 years, it's They've still so it stupid. Since you were actually a teen. No, no, they weren't. <laughs> I have not. <laughs> you just haven't gotten with it yet. <laughs> okay, well, let me cut that part out.